Welcome to the Virtualization Security Video Podcast, episode one, number one, I guess. We're trying this news. This is episode 150-something. But um, with me now is Mike Foley from VMware Technical Marketing. He is in charge of the vSphere Security Endeavors. Welcome to the podcast, Mike. And I can't hear you. Unplug. There we go. No, I hit mute by accident. You hit mute by accident. The the wonderful things about technology. Ain't technology grand? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So um, actually, Neil, that line is from an old MASH episode where they're trying to make a phone call to the States and they're going, the state? Well, you're calling from where? Korea. You know where the fun is? And they're going, (laughs) really? Yeah. Ain't technology grand? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Welcome, MASH. So today we want to talk about three different things. Since this is our inaugural video podcast, um, hopefully continue to do more, and I would really like to do more. Um, I'm Edward Holetke, a.k.a. Will. You can find me all over the network and at www.astroarch.com slash blog for my blog and www.virtualizationpractice.com. You can find Mike's stuff at www.vmware.com slash, where is that, security... How about just go to Y-E-L-O-F dot com? There you go, Y-E-L-O-F dot com. It's about me. <laughs> That's about Mike. The rest of it is about VMware security, and he does write for that occasionally. Yeah, and you can find me on Twitter at, at Mike Foley. And I'm at TexIWill. So there you go. So today we want to talk about three things. Um, the first one is the security of the Internet of Things. Now, when we... When we say the Internet of Things, Mike rolls his eyes, I immediately think of three distinctly different things. Okay. I think of home automation. Yep. And everything related to Z-Wave and X10 and all the different mechanisms for automating your home and securing your home and cameras and the works. Right. I think industrial, which is really SCADA controllers, cameras again, um, even the little things. Things things that you use Stuxnet to take out. (laughs) That and also these, your little iPhones, which have devices in them that say for proximity, so the NFC um, login mechanisms, which are really intriguing. Right. Bang to log in, never need another password. Okay. Okay. and then I also think about, you know, the office itself, where you're doing different automation, and it's all controlled by different right. things. Well, again, it's cameras and lights and heat and things of that nature, which are okay. pretty standard, but you're also automating more tracking of employees and, and things of that nature. Okay. And, uh I have a company. I have a friend. I, I, of, I have a friend. The, of, I, see, I, have I a fr- see the Internet of Things as closer to, um, uh, you know, gajillions of little devices all connected on the net. I would agree with you, but I think there's a gajillions of different little devices depending on where you're looking. Yep. And I think most people think of home automation and and or what they do in their office over SCADA controllers and stuff. Yes. Yeah, I mean, home home automation is really starting to take off. You can buy home automation units at Staples, online at Amazon. You can buy home automation at Lowe's. Uh, it's relatively mm, simple to to set up. You know, I mean, I can can't can see, see that. There we go. There yeah. we go. And I can very easily, if I can touch it, I can. Turn on the lights in here. Now it's brighter, right? Relatively easy to set that up. And you don't have to leave your desk. And I don't even have to leave my desk. So one of the things I install this for is because I'm out here in a separate building from my house is, uh, especially in the wintertime, I want to be able to wake up, check the news, have my tea, and turn on the heat that's out uh, out here. Absolutely. So that- so that when I come out here, it's warm. But I don't want to set a thermostat because I don't want to run the heat all night long. And what's really intriguing, what I think the biggest issue with IoT specifically for home use is that 
the controllers are not all that safe. They're not all that secure. So basically, just like people using various Twitter tools um, to tell you that I'm at such and such, like Swarm and so forth. Right. A lot of these home automation tools are broadcasting to the world. You know, I just turned on such and such. It's like, oh, yeah, and now Mike's out of his house. Right. And if right. You... Well, it, I mean, it even goes a lot more basic than that. So the, the unit that, that I'm using right now, um, uh, $100, it's about that big, about that thick, probably ARM-based, uh, definitely running Linux or some variant thereof. <clears throat> And connected via Wi-Fi. Connected by Wi-Fi. Um, I looked into an awful lot of the different units. So Vera, the one I'm using, Wink, uh, Iris, um, n a number of others. Uh, the one that the one that's Smart Things. That's the one that Samsung bought. And in almost every single case, they require the cloud uh, in order to access the device securely. Now the Vera can run without having the need for accessing the cloud, but you can't put a username and password on it. So all I need is access to your Wi-Fi, and it's game over and I can be flipping lights on and off and, you know, stuck netting a house, right? Yeah, and I think that that's the biggest problem right now is that most use Wi-Fi. Yep. Most use a cloud service. The one I use is actually wired. It's connected up, and I use a wired everything in the house, basically. I use Wi-Fi for guests in a few, like, iPhone devices, yeah. and I so, use a so, separate I, network for that. But I, I have my Vera on, on a uh, – I didn't uh, hook it up with Wi-Fi. I hooked it up with uh, um, uh, an Ethernet connection. But it has virtually no security built in. None whatsoever. Right? It, there, all you need is an HTTP connection to it, and you can be playing with stuff. And um, so I, you know, and, and, and it's not alone. I'm not trying to single out Vera. I'm only saying it because I own one. Uh, but a number of the others I looked at had poor to little security. Some were not getting regular updates. Uh, I really wonder what levels of OpenSSL they're using or what levels of uh, other other crypto type libraries that they're using. Um, you know, are they just kind of dependent on whatever they get from open source? I don't know. In so mine, the, they can in, do a lot of really cool things, but nobody is putting security front and center security as we've as we've been talking about for years and years is always, oh, we should do security at some point. Or, hey, we'll give you a better way of doing this. If you implement it this way, you'll be more secure. But if the base, if I have access to your house, who cares? I know right. if I have access to your Wi-Fi, and we all know Wi-Fi is super secure. Sure. You know, I can find out, especially in a, like a neighborhood like mine, where I can't, if I look out on the street, I'll see 10 cars. And they all belong there. And I won't know any difference between the ones that will and will not. I live in a subdivision. So anybody could be looking at my Wi-Fi traffic right now. I mean, right. I try to secure it and things like that, but it's trivially easy to get in. Now, yeah. my controller is actually tied to another component of my house, and it's constantly being updated by the company that maintains it. Right. So it actually knocks my devices off. The controller all the time so right. half the time they work half the time they don't and i have no control over when they work right i i guess i guess my point is is i'm you know here here we are uh the company i work for sells cloud services and we try to do it in a secure fashion uh everyone wants to sell secure cloud services uh but what if you're someone like me, and I'm guessing probably like you, where there are certain things I don't want ha to have any piece of it running in the cloud? It really, to me, needs to be local. It's a it's a privacy issue. 
I don't want someone to break into uh, you know, uh, Joe, Joe Bob's home automation system and then be able to pull down the records of a million people, throw that into a, a Hadoop database and start figuring out where, where, what are the neighborhoods that are you know, most vulnerable? Well, and you don't even need Hadoop to do that. Yeah, I know, but you know, you, that's that's. I don't want to dive into the specifics, but that's that's kind of the 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 thing of where I'm going is there's a huge amount of privacy data that can be data mined. Absolutely, and I my biggest concern is that with IoT, not only is that people going to be mining, like let, let's let's talk about Nest. Everything Nest does goes back to Google. Yes. Everything and Nest is great for certain things, but yep. Google now basically owns all your data. They know well, when you're home, well, when let, you're let, not. Let's, let, let's clarify here, and this is one of the reasons why I like certain companies versus others. Is uh, with certain companies you are not the product. That's with right. other companies such as Google, you are. You are the product, and. Okay, so people will say, well, what does Google get out of knowing, uh, you know, stuff coming out of Nest? They can then, in turn, sell that sort of data to companies that would be interested in it. Like the people that provide your TV services so that they know, oh, you're home? Let me give you this ad. Or you left in the middle of the night? Well, let's let's do something different. Oh, and then you find out that the next thing you bought was diapers? Well, someone's pregnant, so. Yes. And now we can start marketing that way, and it becomes very, very targeted very, very quickly. Well, they know, you know, net, net, the Nest has, I believe it has a motion detector. Yep, they know. So it knows it. when someone's in the house. Um, it will figure out over time the times when you're there and adjust the temperatures accordingly, and then be able to get very easily in a very short period of time recognize a pattern mike wakes up at a certain time he goes out the door at a certain time he's not back until a certain time and and he uses this much electricity or that much heat or that much oil or gas or whatever um all of that is interesting data to someone it's not probably not terribly interesting to me or you but it's interesting to someone well, I'll tell you, it's interesting to crim that, it's interesting that to any a commodity that can be then dealt and sold. And, it, and I, I just, I, I, I don't, I don't want to depend. Like, for example, the current uh, smart things. Back to home automation, the current smart things device. When you say turn on a light, it doesn't happen locally on the device. The device sends that off to, off to the cloud. The cloud goes, okay, and then sends the command to the device to send it over Z-Wave to turn on the light. And I find that really, really annoying. I, I find it really, really creepy. It is creepy, and that's why I don't own a Nest. That's why I don't use devices like that, because I want to protect my privacy, my family. And you I know, think that's I think that's the difference is that if we were to teach security by saying, how would you protect your family? Here's the choice. Do you want to protect your family or do you not want to protect your family? And everybody will say, I want to protect my family. And it's like, okay, if you did X, Y, and Z to protect your family, the equivalent in the cyber world is ABC. Most people would do it, but they're not taught that way. They're taught, well, you have to do this for business purposes instead of yeah, family then, purposes. Then we'd, then we'd be giving our kids jitterbug phones, and that's not going to work. <laughs> well, I'm. I mean, I gave my kids my one my one of my old iPads, but it's locked down six ways to Sunday. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it, it's it's like anything in security, whether we're talking about the Internet of Things, home automation, virtualization, firewalls. Pick a security topic. At the end of the day, it is all about risk management. Absolutely, and the risk right. is and you something need to you have understand. To judge. And then be able to say, I'm willing to deal with that. So I have all my email hosted in Google Apps. Why? Because I hated running my own email server. 
And I'm the opposite. I run my own email server and right. I use Google for as a backup just in case the other one goes down. Yeah, and and you know, it's it, it at that stage it was a question of um, they could run email servers better than me because I didn't have the time nor the inclination to be spending a couple of hours a week trying to figure out sendmail.cf and and other di different antivirus and and spam catching tools. It was a lot easier when uh, I wouldn't get a phone call while I was on a business trip saying the server's down and I don't have email and I'm going to lose this gig, you know, with my wife saying that about her business. So it was much it, from a, a from a blood pressure standpoint, it was much better for me to just move it all to Google, move my wife all to Google and be done with it. Well, here's the funny thing is mindset for, and forget. I no longer worry about that. I haven't worried about that in, in years because I found a better service like Barracuda, the Barracuda service or something like that yep. for a small business works out really, really well. But it's a cloud-based service. You have a local instance, but all the rules are created up in the cloud and they do all their judgment there. And you can right. you can choose to pass your messages to them or not. Right. And, but I don't really pay much attention to it. I just use it. And it's, mail's gotten to that point now where you can just use it and not have to worry about it. Are there false positives? There's false positives even in Always. Google. Always. Always. But so, enough, about, is... enough about IoT. We're going to leave okay. it as we're going to leave it That's... as you got to know your own risk and what you're willing to accept. That would be a good takeaway from this is that think about it before you implement it. But oh, yeah. realize what you're going to be getting yourself into. So the second part of our conversation, and well, well, this one should be really short, is is RSA conference still a viable option for IT? Has it ever been an has the has attending the RSA conference ever been an option for IT or only an option for security professionals? I have actually seen a change in the last couple of years that it's more both. I've actually redirected a lot of people that have security questions to say, you know what, you should go to RSA conference. Yeah, and I'm not saying, I, I'm not, and I'm not saying go to RSA conference to go to the sessions. Yeah, because the sessions aren't there for IT people. No, they're not. What I would say is, you want to learn about security, go to the edges of the show floor and look at all the new things. Yeah. Don't. I mean, if you want to go see the big boys, go to the big boys. They're they're in their own own conference, own own show floor now. There's only about eight or nine of them in there, but the edges are really where it's at. If you want to find out what's new and upcoming, go there. If you're interested in talking tech, whoa, what are you doing? Sorry, I'm just moving. You're getting me dizzy. Sorry. Okay, he wants to turn right. his heat back it, on. It, this, this, I'm, I'm trying to find a better way for the camera. It, I'm, I feel everyone's looking at my head. Well, we were. Go ahead. So I think going, I think it's still there for IT if you know how to use a conference. It's like any conference. If you go there just for the talks, some of those talks are for IT. Most of them are not. They're for researchers. Yeah, you know, it's... I'm not going to the RSA conference this year. A um, couple of reasons. One, I was supposed to do a session with someone uh, from VMware, and that person left VMware, so therefore he had asked me to co-present with him, and um, I didn't find out until it was too late. By that time, I, it was going to be difficult to find a hotel, and I just said, you know what, uh, I'm not going to go. This was the first time in many, many years. Yeah, this is the first time since 2006, right? So, yeah, a long time. Um, and I'd... so I just, I just, um, then I started looking at, like last year, I looked at the sessions and I went, there's really not a whole lot here that I am terribly interested in, you know? Yes, you, you got things on crypto, you got things on law. Well, it Eve, Eve, certainly there were certainly there were really cool technical stuff like 
you know, the, some of the most of the crypto stuff is just like way over my head. I mean, that that's a whole other level of geekdom, right? Oh, it's um, really cool stuff, though. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I mean, it's fascinating. And then I walk out and I'm dribbling and drooling because my brain is mush. Um, <clears throat> but you know, I, 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 those are those are somewhat interesting. And now and, all I see is your head, so you need to back up just a little bit. There. All right. Those are those are all somewhat interesting, but I wanted to find out what were some of the thoughts around some of the things that you and I have been talking about for years, and I just felt that looking at all of the sessions, there was a serious disconnect between um, where things are going from a DevOps. Uh, managing security at scale sort of stuff that you and I have been talking about for a number of years and the traditional security market of slap some antivirus in a firewall, you're compliant, right? It, 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 I, I see a lot of the stuff on the RSA security, uh, the RSA conference side going a lot more towards the traditional network security. Yep. Firewalls, antivirus, and compliance. I see a lot more compliance and not, unless you're at the edges of the conference show and, floor. And quite honestly, not a whole lot has changed in eight years no. around firewalls, GRC, compliance, and antivirus. Well, there's always new antivirus signatures. There's always new compliance regulations. But has anything drastically changed to make security better? In my opinion, no. From a management perspective, there's at least two companies that are working on that. Like what? Cloud Passage and Illumio. Yes. They are unique in that they are doing management very, very different than anybody else. And they are yes. thinking scale. Yes. They designed around scale. So this is a big thing. So those are the two worth looking at. And I'll be talking to them as well when I go. I'm going, I mean, as an analyst, I go because I want to find out what's new. That's why I spend a day walking the show floor. Right. But if I wanted to go to a session, some of the sessions at, um, at InfoSec World and Cloud Security World are better because they're yes. more targeted. And it's, but yes. it's a smaller audience. And it's people that are really interested in those technologies. Yeah. But but the expo floor is really, really tiny. You don't learn anything much new there on the show floor. You learn a lot more new in the sessions. And I think RSA conference is the reverse. Unless think, you're a researcher, then you learn a lot. <laughs> well, you know, the there's what what I find is that in um a number of conferences that started off as reasonably reasonable size, but now have grown into mega conferences. Um, the original intent of the conference, so the original intent of the RSA conference was to share information and discuss and and learn what other people are doing, um, and it was a lot it was a lot more hands on type of stuff. And over time, it's kind of morphed into more of a marketing and networking event. I would agree with you there. But and it seems to be the only only big one where you get that many vendors together from all over the world. Yeah. I mean, if you really want to do something when you go to RSA, go to B-Size. Yes. You really want to learn and get learn something new at IT. B-Size is free, usually. If you sign up early enough, it's cloud sourced and front end and for for all the articles and talk and the discussions. So it's actually a really good beside conference. Right. Yeah. Trying to do what RSA and some of the other conferences originally wanted to do. So okay, end of conversation. People okay. can make a judgment of it all. I think if you're going to go, go to the edges of the show floor first. Yeah, See if the you're new gonna stuff. go find Edward, you won't find me. <laughs> I'll be there somewhere. Um, 
Also, now the last thing we wanted to talk about was hardening guides. You and I have both written them. We both reviewed them. Yep. We've been heavily involved in the VMware one for, oh, two and a half years. Well, you've been two and a half years. Mine's before that. (laughs) Yep. I think I wrote one of the first ones and kind of floored some VMware folks by saying, you need to put this behind a firewall Um, way back in the day. And got the DISA folks really upset with me when I said it, their, their hardening guide wasn't worth the paper it was written on. <laughs> and I was involved with the CIS security one. But, and DISA got better to be like the one to use, but now it's yeah. not worth the paper it's written on. Again, because it's it doesn't really do anything automated. It has it's All the rules are physical. The VMware hardening guide has changed a lot since you've taken it over. My tools to run through and do hardening have changed based on that. Mm-hmm. But I think that you and I, ha- I mean, this is a general thing. Hardening guides, when you look at a hardening guide, if I look at a hardening guide for Windows, it is a hardening guide for Windows. If you want to harden SQL, you have to have the SQL hardening guide. If you want to have hardened exchange, you also have to have the exchange hardening guide. But what I like looking at is the system itself. The system needs to be hardened because if I just harden, let's just let's pick on a hypervisor. If I just harden a hypervisor and I just harden an app and I just harden vCenter or the management console, OpenStack, whatever you want to name it, use, I hit those, but I hit and miss all the integrations between everything. So they those integrations end up becoming fairly major attack points. So no one's really looking at the system as a whole. Yeah, to a certain extent, I can I can I can agree with you. Um, I think um, before we dive too deep into that, I'd like to say, from a VMware standpoint, um, the hardening guide is a list of guidelines. It is not a list of mandates. You should go through each guideline and see if it applies to you. And if it, if it is relevant to you, it's a back to a question of risk management. Um, and that while, yes, things kind of sort of need to be looked at from a big picture view, like, uh, you know, if I'm running vSphere plus SQL Server plus uh, vRealize Automation plus VCO plus a whole bunch of PowerShell scripts and so on and so forth, All of that intermix from a hardening standpoint is a challenge. But that's what everybody's doing. But that's what everybody's doing. I I hear you. And And they're doing it badly. I make a (laughs) full-time career out of just doing that. And I have. And I don't want to. Uh, <laughs> but I have. I mean, I have. But when you st- so I, I posted on internal forum recently uh, that uh, you know the hardening guide was coming and so on and so forth. And I got one guy saying we need a hardening guide for everything. And I said I am not the one signing up for that. No, and that's where you actually need some external source to take care of it and more look at the big picture and give a. And I think that this is the difference is that there's hardening guides as in this is how you harden the system. There's right. operational so guides I, about how you use it, but there's also a security operations about how you should set things up so that it is properly used from a security perspective. Yes. For, so, exam- for example, this used to be in the hardening guide. We, you and I have gone back and forth on whether or not it really should be there. And that is the general rule is is that you for every service that you have inside of the vSphere, or vCenter, or vCloud Suite, vRealize Suite tool set, they all should have unique usernames instead of SSO or vCenter or wherever they're connecting to. That is an operational suggestion. Not everybody does that. Most people just say admin. It's like everybody has admin access. <coughs> yeah. And you've yeah. gone back and forth, but the main thing is is that if we were to make that part of a hardening guide, you would have to be able to detect it in some fashion. Yeah, so... I, and that's, I that becomes with, very hard if you don't know the system. I was talking with someone yesterday, 
and I was explaining to him about how in version six of the vSphere hardening guide, I've separated out the uh, what we'll call the programmatic stuff. You know, what is what is the setting of uh, what is the value of this setting? Should it be true or false? Yes or no? Whatever, right? And then there is the more uh, operational stuff around, you know, um, run it, running with separate management networks and so on and so forth. And he, he said, you're using an awful lot of words to, <clears throat> to explain this. What you're really talking about, Mike, is the difference between the science, which is the programmatic stuff, and the art, which is the operational stuff. Science, you can test and get a value. Operational uh, art is usually something that's left to the person who's judging it. So for company A, they may say, oh, we don't need management networks. Co company B says, I'd like a management network, but that means I need to involve the networking guy. Company C would say, yeah, we can do a management network. Yeah, you can work with the networking guy, but now how are we going to implement it? So that and I is would part, argue that, and I, that's the art. And, and I, I would, know you will disagree. And I will argue the uh, complete opposite. If you do not have a separate management network for your virtual environment, regardless of whose hypervisor it is, shoot yourself in the foot now. Oh, no, we're, we're in violent agreement with that, right? It's like don't do it if you cannot pull – the strings politically but to get that, that to that happen. Is, that's not, that's that a nightmare not the waiting to happen. That's not the point I'm making. You and I both agree violently on that point, right? Yeah. But at the end of the day, that may not be a technical decision. It may be a business decision to not do that. Well, so it ends up being a... I agree with you. It's anything that you do, regardless, regarding a hardening guide, a guide is just that, a guideline. You don't have to do them. It is recommendations. And the same thing for compliance. Compliance is a bunch of recommendations. If you do not do them, you have to explain why. Yes. It may politically be politically expedient to say, hey, I'm PCI compliant, but you know what? These 20 things I didn't care about and explain why you didn't care. Right. And the thing is, is that saying that your CISO said he doesn't care is not a good answer. Right. The CISO now has to step up to the plate and explain why they basically did made that decision. And it's all politics. I agree yes. with you 100% on that. But I'll also state for the record that if you're not following the guideline, specifically around management networks and things like that, even though you put them in op they're, they're considered operational changes, these have been discussed since day one of yep. virtualization. I was talking about these with people in 2004. Yep. And they still don't seem to get it. And if that's the case, you know, people like me are, and the hackers out there are just going to be able to drive a Mack truck through this stuff. And it's like some operational stuff is science. It's not art. And it's detectable. But it's a holistic systems detection instead of a API level. API level. It's using all sorts of APIs to detect it. Let's just say that. It, it's, a, it's a much more elegant um, art. Uh, there's an art to, de to the detection. Absolutely. And people well, that have been... While, while, you, while there is a science to, to detect certain things, it takes a fair amount of art to find all that science and put it together in such a way that someone can understand it. Right. Agreed. Right. So w about a week or two ago, I just on a whim went to Google and I typed in, you know, hardening guides and I typed in hardening guide for Linux, hardening guide for, for windows, hardening guide for this, hardening guide for that. And I was really surprised at the lack of quality content that's out there. Now, one of the things that I've discovered in, in going through the vSphere hardening guide over the past couple of years is from a science standpoint, the, the programmatic standpoint, 
in many cases, um, the default value is the hardened value, right? But there is a whole class of customer for whom, um, and, and I'll point the fingers at you, federal government, uh, there's a whole class of customer that for, if there is a setting, it must have a value so that it can be audited. Absolutely. Right? So while the, the value, if you query the value in vSphere, it might be uh, null, the actual value is true. But it needs right? to be Because set. in the code, it's written as the value is true, but reports as null. So I then have to go through, talk with engineers, find out what the actual value is, and now start putting the desired value is true so that people who are doing an audit can say, look, it's true, as opposed to, look, it has no value. I have no idea what it means. And that's, and that's pretty normal, but most hardening guides also include things from the past. As vSphere and all the hypervisors have gotten more and better, a lot of the options that were there two years ago are gone. Yes. And so when I started, so people, so people started, think they need all of them still set when they're ignored. Yeah. So when I, um, I took the opportunity, this is the first dot zero release of vSphere in quite some time. Yes. Um, it, it, I went into it with a very open mind and I, what I felt was I, I inherited the five O the, the five the five dot x series of hardening guides two and a half years ago and as, as you go through the three dot x four dot x five dot x you see stuff that's getting carried over right and it's too much of it was not actually valid right and so with six i said you know what it's time to knock down the the jenga tower of the hardening guide and pick it all up and start it all fresh and so uh, I made a number of trips out to Palo Alto, met with lots of engineers, went through every single guideline, still going through guidelines as uh, uh, even today. I just um, I just removed one from the best practices guide today. Um, all of these things, I mean, there's there's so much stuff that you have to be extremely detail oriented in order to get the, the answers. It. Um, Starting off with a fresh set of eyes and a full review, and pu we pulled out a whole bunch of stuff. There was one setting one engineer said, there hasn't been code for that in, in the hypervisor since the 3X days. Oh, yeah. Okay, delete. And he went, That's really? And I went, yeah, really. You said it's, it's not there. Let's just delete it. Now, I fully expect a number of people are going to have a panic attack when they get the external beta of the hardening guide next week? Um, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I'll see what I, happens I, when I, I look at it. If I have a heart attack, I'll let you know. <laughs> I have reviewed uh, the, the course that I'm taking with the hardening guide with lots of customers, big and small. I have reviewed it with at least one major auditor that understands virtualization security and they liked the direction that I was going in. One customer, when I told, when I did a presentation of the changes that are happening in the hardening guide, said, you have just made my life easier. I can now hit the easy button on all the things that need to be set, and now I can f focus purely on the things that need to be discussed. But one of the things that most hardening guides are lacking, which is actually what I find, and that is, is that a written scope of what it is covering. And that's actually kind of important because if I'm not, if I don't know the scope of the guide, I may assume it is a bigger scope than it is. Like, and for I think example, a lot of, I think a lot of people have done that with the VCR hardening guide. And when I looked at, when I worked on the CIS security one um, ways back, and I still review it. I was always looking at the scope of the guide because, unfortunately, a virtual environment, whether it's vSphere, KVM, Red Hat, RHEV, you know, mm -hmm. Hyper-V, Zen, in Link Secure, 
all have the same sort of hardening requirements. Sure. But they all involve external systems that are outside of the scope of the hypervisor. So when we start talking about scope, what's involved with that scope is what I would love to see as a, as a graphic saying, okay, for vSphere, it's, it's this, this, and this. That's what's in scope. They're all talking to each other, done. For Hyper-V, I would love to say, okay, it's this, this, and this. It's all do it, talking to each other and done. But I've yet to see that diagram that's very clear. Let's just say that. It's not clear. But when I start looking at what I personally own for vSphere and KVM and, and Red Hat in the scope that I need for a hardening of my system, the hardening guys are just a really tiny subset of that. And people need to realize it's still a tiny subset of it. You need to still think about security of the whole environment and not just concentrate on the hypervisor. There may be a guideline that says do X, Y, and Z, but you know what? You may have a compensating control somewhere else in your system that does X, Y, and Z for you already. Yep. It's not as easy as saying, I gotta meet this. It's just like, no, I got an environment I need to secure. I have an environment I need to be in compliance. Look at it as an environment and see where it goes from there and then pick and choose. This is the whole thing. Pick and choose the guidelines that apply to your environment. Yep. But some of these are no-brainers. They really are. It's like, just do them. They won't hurt you to do them. Will it hurt me to do this? No. Will it hurt me to do that? Some of them are a yes. Don't do them. It's the different risk profiles that you have in the guide. But I think people are missing the point that a hardened guide is not a system security state statement. And that's because they don't understand the scope of the guides today. Because there's no yeah, I, I, I think if you if you went through the hardening guide, you would find an awful lot of stuff. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, an awful lot of stuff is the default value is the desired value. So are you hardening? No, that's an audit. Yeah. Because what yeah. you want to check is to ensure that someone hasn't turned that off of the default value. Um, that's why it's in there, not because you need to set it, but because you need to audit it. Sure, and, sure. you know, people think, I'll be more secure if I implement the hardening guide. Mm -mm. No, not necessarily. You, you know, need you the other things. The, you can implement the hardening guide seven ways to Sunday today, but if you have a sloppy, uh, if you, if, if you have a sloppy card system getting into your building, it's game over. If you have sloppy, uh, uh, you know, uh, password requirements, it could be game over. I mean, there's, it all boils down to the hardening guide is but one layer of defense in depth. And I would say that if you, and if you haven't looked at your system architecture anytime recently, now's the time to do it. Because as people upgrade the vSphere 6, as a perfect opportunity to revisit that architecture and make mm -hmm. sure it meets security requirements and compliance requirements for your organization. If it doesn't, perfect opportunity to change it. Yep. And I'm going to say that architecture is king in, when you're talking about security. You can't bolt this stuff on. Yeah, I mean, just just in the install and configure course for, for for vSphere, the first thing they say is before you create your first VM, architect your your environment. Absolutely. Right. You can't just go click click click. Okay, start building VMs without having thought through some of this. Well, unfortunately, most people have. Oh, of course. So I'm going to leave. Let's leave the right. podcast at that point where we say architecture is king, and you need to really work on your architecture. And if you haven't, perfect opportunity to go forward. Think about security. Think about hardening. Think about those, risk management. And think about the risks you're willing to take. And, and when you're talking compliance, remember if you don't do a step, you still have to describe why you didn't. Right. To make the auditors happy. And compliance does not mean security. And security does not mean compliance. Exactly. Thank you. And this has been the first video podcast of the Virtualization Security um, Roundtable. Thank you very much, Mike. We out. <laughs>